Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Burb Nest. Um, today, I will be talking about uh, stable coins and most importantly, algorithmic stable coins, as there's been a very intense conversation about algorithmic stable coins. Are they sustainable? Uh, will they survive? Um, the, the, well, I'll be covering a little bit about the fight between uh, DAI and um, USD, UST, for example. So uh, I hope that everyone is ready, and uh, I hope this is helpful. Um, so I'm Julian, and I'll be diving right in. All right, so here we go. I wrote this back in late January, um, and it... it Okay, it's a kind of a walk through this article on uh, stable coins, um, why they're important. Um, stable coins are actually, um, according to data, it's it's um, the biggest sector in crypto, and it's actually part of like the biggest growing economy in crypto. Um, so uh, you have to consider that almost every trading pair in crypto is against a stable coin. So. Um, we can't ignore stable coins as they are today, especially if we want crypto to continue to grow. Uh, we have to remember the total crypto market cap is actually um, much, much smaller than uh, the total market cap of something like gold. And considering stable coins are such an important part of DeFi and the crypto ecosystem as a whole, um, it's very important to understand what you're using when you want to escape volatility um, from prices. Uh, that said, uh, there's a lot of unfortunate things that happen with stablecoins. For example, USDT can be banned. So um, this is a, a, a slightly old. I'm I'm sure there could be more USDT that has been banned since um, uh, this image was taken back in January um, or so. So we can see kind of um, the total banned um, Ethereum addresses that held UST at one point or still have frozen USDT at one point. Um, USDT, as we know, is um, centralized. It's controlled by Tether and by, if I'm not mistaken, I think it's Bitfinex. Um, so we, we generally don't want to use something that can be frozen because this goes against uh, what crypto is. Um, next, I'll actually look at what is backing something like USDC, for example. I'm pretty sure this is the USDC backing um, that I shared um, in the article down here. Um, so if we look at this, yeah, the image was by Coinbase, and it's the backing for um, Tether, actually, which um, historically has been very shady. Um, we have never had an official view of what is backing Tether. Um, many think, oh, it's just dollars in a bank account somewhere, but it's actually not. Um, as we can see this crazy split, cash and cash equivalents. So what are cash equivalents? Well, we can go into the second split over here, which is this one, which is commercial paper, fiduciary deposits, actual cash, reverse repo notes and treasury bills. So this isn't all real cash. On top of that, um, a lot of the backing is secured loans, corporate bonds, and other investments, including digital tokens. So this gives you a general idea of how Tether, or the, mo the biggest stable coin today, is actually um, not really backed by uh, what many would imagine. If I go to CoinGecko, actually, um, we can actually see the size of stable coins um, and, and kind of get an idea of like the biggest stable coins out there. And if, if this is important, um, if we're using stable coins, something like Tether or USDC, even Binance, like, all of these are centralized. This means that they can be frozen, they can be subpoenaed, uh, government can go after them. So 
that's why stable coins are uh it's very important to know what you're parking your money in because um the most common phrase in, in crypto often is not your keys not your coins but if you're holding something like a stable coin which is so very centralized even if it's in your wallet your wallet could be banned and frozen um or the stable coin simply frozen um in your wallet so this is why I will be talking more about developments in something like UST or FRAX. So I'll, I'll jump over to this picture over here. This is the percentage of stable coin supplies locked in Ethereum smart contracts. Of course, this has actually grown quite a bit. Um, this was, uh, this ended in around November, this graph, yeah, October 20th. So, um, since then, there's been a lot more use of stable coins. We've had a market pullback and people have fled into stable coins a lot more. And there, there's a lot of stable coin usage. So this has definitely grown, but we get a good idea of one, DAI is the most used stable coin on Ethereum. USDC is the second most and USDT isn't so used in DeFi, which is actually kind of great. Um, uh, ideally, as we move forward, we'll see less USDC and uh, DAI is something that um, it's it's a tricky one because it, even though it is decentralized, um, it is a stable coin that has backing. Um, what does that mean? Um, when, so, when a stable coin has backing, um, here we go. It has a bunch of different tokens that back the price of uh, that holds its peg at one to one. So this is um, DAI and what is backing DAI. And we can actually see that um, there's a lot of USDC backing DAI. Um, so what are some of the issues with this? Uh, well, one, if USDC is ever frozen in the DAI vaults, then this can cause a problem because it would depeg because they don't have access to that USDC. They they would essentially lose part of their backing, as we can see here. Um, in the middle, USDC is is one of the biggest backers in DAI, um, and this can cause a lot of problems if there ever is um, some type of freeze on those assets. Uh, even if DAI is decentralized, it could depeg and destabilize DAI. Um, why might this happen? Well, there's a couple uh, reasons. I don't. Uh, I generally don't like to fud, um, but I will. I will just list some reasons that are important to be uh, watching out for. So, for example, if USDC is frozen um, in MakerDAO, which it, are the issuers of Dai, uh, what could be the reasons? Well, maybe the SEC decides that Maker is. Um, uh, uh, a security and that they're not allowed to issue stable coins. So then they have, they can easily go over to Circle, who are the creators of USDC and tell them, hey, we want you to froze it, to freeze uh, all of the USDC that DAI is holding because they're a security. So that could be something that uh, affects DAI directly. We could have something like the founders of um, Maker or DAI um, uh, get caught up in some illicit activities and then that would also cause a government body to freeze the USDC. So um, understanding that gives you a good idea of, well, even if on the surface DAI is decentralized, if its backing is not decentralized, it's actually pretty centralized because it's controlled by Circle, then uh, you can't, it, it's, it's not truly decentralized, is it? Um, that said, there's other problems with stable coins that are collateralized. So let's see, uh, I'll talk a little bit about collateralized stable coins as we have most at the top. Tether is collateralized. Um, USDC is collateralized. Uh, Binance is collateralized. So the top three are collateralized. What does this mean? It means that for every $1 worth of Tether, or USDC or these stable coins, um, there is a dollar equivalent of collateral, of something that is backing. So for the first three, um, as we already mentioned over here, 
we have the different reserves. There's the cash, there's the fiduciary deposits, there's corporate bonds. There, all of these are backing um, uh, and stabilizing the price. We have a similar effect with DAI. Um, however, it's more decentralized. And when it started, a lot of the backing was actually in um, Ethereum, which to me was awesome. DAI was an awesome project when it started. It had Ethereum backing. It had some really cool mechanics. Um, and then slowly as they grew, they switched over to having uh, other kinds of backing like USDC. So what's the issue with having collateral as a stable coin? Well, it becomes really hard to scale. When you want to get to really big numbers, um, the biggest example is Tether because it is a 82 billion, which is an enormous amount for crypto in general, but also for stable coins. Um, it means that you need 82 billion worth of backing of collateral to store somewhere, um, especially because you're often dealing with real fiat currency. So DAI has the issue where uh, in order to scale, there has to be a, a lot of money that is locked up so that it can print more money. Um, so I'll talk about algorithmic stable coins. And what are those? Um, algorithmic stable coins are coins that do not have um, a literal backing. They don't have a collateral that is backing the price. They have different mechanics that justify and keep the price solvent. Um, so let's first start with Frox. Frox is an awesome project built on Ethereum. And Frax is a fractional algorithmic stablecoin. So what does this mean? Can be a little complicated. Fractional algorithmic means it is not 100% algorithmic. It is partially backed. So right here, we can see a little bit of how to mint and create Frax or FXS, which is a stablecoin. Um, you have it's uh, partially collateralized. So whereas with DAI or USDT, um, most of these are often over collateralized. So for every $1, there is usually $1.2 um, of backing in the treasury. Um, those aren't the exact numbers, but that's general concept. With FRAX, it goes the other way. For every $1 of FRAX issued, there is often right around 80% of USDC and the rest is covered by a mechanism of burning um, FRAX tokens. So the FRAX tokens uh, help it scale a lot easier. Um, and it has this very complicated math over here, but I'm really gonna try to simplify it as much as possible. Um, FRAX tokens uh, act almost as a crutch to allow it to scale a lot easier because it does not need the same type of collateral. It does not need the same type of collateral to continue scaling. Um, furthermore, Frax has implemented a new um, what's it called new collateral types and is working towards um, separating itself from the USDC collateral and is looking to implement collateral like Bitcoin or other um, crypto that would help stabilize the FRAX price, help it grow, but also make it a lot more decentralized. So FRAX suffers a similar fate of DAI where as much as their protocol is really awesome, um, they have really cool technology on how they have worked, how they're trying to grow. But if your collateral is USDC, then you have lost your decentralized effect. Um, essentially, you're not no longer decentralized when you have backing that is centralized. All right, so we covered Frax, which is number seven. It's 2.6 billion market cap. One of the biggest issues with Frax is it's it has struggled to grow. Why has it struggled to grow? Well, partly because um, it, it's it was built on Ethereum and it has not done too much to go cross chain. It is slowly going cross chain and more people are starting to use Frax, but uh, it is something that I'll finish with UST 
Terra has worked really hard on as it expands to more chains, it becomes more accessible, and it partners with more most amount of protocols. I will mention MIM. MIM is a collateralized stablecoin, which had a really awesome project. They did suffer because of the whole um, Wonderland debacle, and they, it, they just kind of had um, a lot of spillover problems with that. However, the Magic Internet Money and Abracadabra project is still really awesome how it works. It uses collateral, but it doesn't use normal collateral. It uses yield-bearing collateral. So this allows you to essentially mint MIM, which is Magic Internet Money, um, using collateral that is earning you interest. So for example, you deposit USDC on Yearn Finance, which is an application that can pay around 5% interest on your stablecoin. And then you, you, in exchange, you get Y USDC, Yearn USDC. You can take that Yearn USDC and deposit it into um, Abracadabra, which is magic internet money. And when you deposit in there, they give you an exchange MIM. You can mint MIM, which would be over collateralized by a yield bearing token. So um, to a certain extent, you are uh, paying off a loan automatically. You're, you're getting a loan against your collateral that is earning money and is slowly paying off your loan. So if later you come back and you've earned you know 20% after four years and you only took a 20% loan on your collateral, um, you can just get your money back and your loan is either just paid off or you paid off with what you've been earning already. So this concept is a really interesting concept of minting and creating stable coins because it means that the stable coin is one, always over collateralized and two, it's, it's yield bearing um, on the back end. So the backing is always gonna be growing. Um, so I'll go back to now the biggest decentralized stablecoin, um, and that is UST. UST is a stablecoin of Terra. So we can see that its growth has been pretty aggressive, to say the least. In the past year, it has gone from, let's go to market cap from a, a market cap of about 1 billion, 1.7 billion last April. Uh, if we go to the full history, we can actually see it went from market cap of 100,000, 300,000, and is currently hovering right around 16.8 billion market cap. It has become the biggest decentralized stablecoin and is um, attempting to become the biggest stablecoin. How are they doing this? And how does UST work? Um, I'll be very quick on explaining UST. It's um, a basic mechanism where Luna, the, um, I'll go over to their website actually, because it might make more sense, programmable money for the internet. So Luna is built, is used and burnt in exchange for UST. So Luna, if we go over here, is a form of collateral for the UST. Um, how does this work? Well, in order to mint one UST, you need to burn $1 worth of Luna. So for every, say you want to create 10 UST, then $10 worth of Luna are to be burnt. What does this do for Luna and its supply? Well, it actually burns the Luna supply and we can actually track what is happening on Terra Analytics right here. We can track how much you, Luna is being burnt to create US team. And we can see it right here. We actually minted Luna the other day because of contraction that is um, UST instead of growing, it became smaller, it contracted. So we went the other way. We burned UST in exchange of Luna. And that is what happened on April 8th. But since then we have gone back to burning Luna and 
minting UST. So as we can see, the circulating supply has been going down, you know, because of the burning mechanics. If we zoom out a little, you scroll down to maybe late March, we were burning pretty aggressively, um, or, you know, Terra was burning. Terra was burning pretty aggressively, you know, 1.5 million Luna a day, maybe a little less. And that was creating a supply shrink on the market, uh, on the circulating supply of Luna. So what does that do for Luna price? Um, essentially what it does is that the market cap, the market cap is the price of Luna times the circulating supply, um, or sorry, divided by the circulating supply. So if we look at the market cap, it has been going up, of course, but it is not the same market cap when it has reached one top. So in on December 24th, it reached $100. And then the second time it reached $100, the market cap was actually much slower. Not that much slower, but it was lower. It was almost a billion, $2 billion lower, $3 billion if you look at this. March 25th, Luna was around $100 as well. And the market cap was, was $3 billion lower. Why is that? Well, there was less circulating supply of Luna. Now, why does this even matter? Um, well, it means that if as long as UST continues this growth, right now it's very aggressive, the Luna price or the Luna supply is shrinking. As the Luna supply shrinks and UST grows, this creates a supply shock effect on Luna. If people suddenly decide they want Luna, there is less Luna to go around because so much of it has actually been burnt and turned into UST. So that is a quick breakdown on how Luna actually functions. And now we'll dive into, is this sustainable? There has been a lot of um, FUD, let's call it, on, oh, Luna and UST are Ponzi's. They do not work. Um, the, they're going to fall. They're going to follow the fate of every algorithmic stablecoin that has been out there. There has been other attempts at algorithmic stablecoins. Um, one example was Titan, uh, which was partially backed, I think, at 50%. And it failed. Now, we have to understand, one, what is a Ponzi? And two, why have others failed? So I'll, I'll be very uh, quick on what a Ponzi is. A Ponzi is when you sell a product that essentially doesn't exist, and its price appreciation depends on someone else purchasing that product and essentially playing hot potato with reselling that fake product. You're collecting people to come and buy something that is not a real product, something that has no offering. Um, it's another way to think about it is you're selling an idea without any backing. So the reason they call UST a Ponzi is because it doesn't have collateral. But that is because they don't understand how it actually works. Um, since uh, there has been a lot of criticism on UST, and it actually hasn't lost its peg. So if we look at the UST price um, in all of history, in May, it did lose its peg. It went all the way down to 96 cents. Um, that was, uh, I think that was the day of the May crash. And yeah, the, the, the as UST was trying to be redeemed for Luna, the, um, the fact that so many people were fleeing out of UST, um, Oh no, look, 80, 85 cents was the low um, in May. And there, there was just so many people trying to flee UST at one time that it created an issue of, um, uh, of keep maintaining the peg. The, the mechanism simply could not keep up with people trying to flee the ecosystem. Um, so what is being done and has it survived since then? So it recovered, as we can see, the price recovered in a about four or three days, it went back to peg and has been at peg ever since. Uh, you know, it, it, it'll go up, it'll go down, but the peg has been relatively stable. It, it has even gone up to $101 and it goes down. So 
the way that Luna and USD work is that it allows for a lot of arbitrage. Um, if there, if UST is below peg, people are incentivized to burn Luna and create, um, sorry, burn UST and create Luna because they are going to get one dollar worth, even if it's below peg. But if it is above peg, like it has been over here when it's trading at one hundred one, people are incentivized to burn Luna and create more UST. So you can freely arbitrage this price difference. Um, and the, the game theory behind the stable coin is that the public is always going to look to capitalize on the arbitrage and that is going to make it more stable. So as we can see, since inception, it had been volatile and it has been getting more and more stable as uh, it has aged, grown and been adopted. So I will move on to, um, well, one. UST is decentralized completely. So this is Do Kwan, the founder of uh, Luna and Terra. And he actually talked about, uh, he mentioned because Tether had recently frozen 160 million of USDT stable coins. And he said, well, we can't actually do that with UST. UST cannot be frozen. It is truly decentralized. It does not have any other collateral that could be frozen. So UST cannot be frozen. That is one, it's truly a decentralized stablecoin. Two, the next step in UST is the um, curve four pool. So if you don't know anything about the curve wars, that's fine, I'll make it very simple. Curve is um, a, si a si similar uh, token uh, DEX or exchange. So it means you can trade like assets, for example, uh, wrapped Ethereum with Ethereum, uh, USDC with USDT, and it, it, it's a form to create a lot of liquidity for these assets so that you can trade big amounts and have a lot of liquidity for these assets. So um, what's happening is that Terra has actually partnered with Frax to control the rewards of Curve to incentivize uh, essentially the biggest liquidity pool on Curve. Curve, as of right now, is the biggest exchange on, in crypto, uh, in decentralized finance. So if we go to DeFi Llama, we can actually see Curve is the, it's the biggest exchange at 20 billion total value locked. So it is the very biggest exchange in all of crypto. Um, and as I said, it's not a real exchange. You're not exchanging Ethereum for Bitcoin. You're exchanging like assets. Most importantly, you're exchanging stable coins. So the fact that they're gonna be essentially controlling curve to um, incentivize UST, FRAX, USDC, and USDT pool. So what does this mean? It, this offers an on-ramp and off-ramp into decentralized stablecoins. It, it's going to make it really easy for participants with very big amounts of money to enter into UST and FRAX. How and why? Well, if you're incentivizing um, Curve or to um, give better rewards to this pool, then users are going to be incentivized to deposit their stablecoins and earn interest in this pool. And if this pool gets big or the bigger this pool gets the easier it's going to be to actually trade into and out of these decentralized stable coins uh, why is this important well you can have a big whale that wants to exchange a million dollars worth of ust uh, into usdc or the other way around and one slippage is going to be a lot lower and two the fees are going to be a lot lower and they're not going to create a de-pegging effect um, when trading these large amounts of money. Previously, because the pools were so small, uh, it could create a de-pegging scenario because the pools would become imbalanced. And since there wasn't a balance in these pools, then uh, you would uh, de-peg certain stable coins within the pool because of this huge imbalance when trading. So 
as more liquidity is added into this pair, um, it's gonna make it really easy for big whales or big users to enter and exit truly decentralized stable coins. So I hope this was a, a, a quick recap and you were able to understand why four pool is important, why your choice of stable coins are so important. I will quickly say UST is the most cross-chain uh, stable coin apart from USDC and USDT. Uh, it's the most decentralized, as I mentioned, but the fact that it's making so many partnerships across different chains is what makes it so unique. Um, it is not, it can't be called a Ponzi if everyone is using it and people start to flock to it. That said, because there has been so much criticism, Terra has decided through the LFG Foundation. Um, so if we go to LFG, um, so the LFG is the Luna Foundation Guard. They decided that what's going to happen is that they're going to be buying Bitcoin, a decentralized asset, and other... Um, so this is actually the Avalanche announcement. They beat me to it. But uh, first, the idea is to have $10 billion worth of Bitcoin to help... Uh, in case of um, bad events to stabilize the price of UST. So as of right now, as I mentioned, you can burn and mint uh, Luna and UST through the mechanism. However, they're creating this defender mechanism where if there is a sudden exit of liquidity and people are flocking out of UST, they will be able to trade their UST into Bitcoin. Um, why is this important? Well, it's going to behave as a release valve as the system kind of becomes smaller and um, the, the people are trying to get out of UST, they can trade into Bitcoin and this is going to take away pressure from the below mechanism of burning and minting and take away pressure from Luna and UST. So. This is a very big development because one, they will continue to truly be decentralized. They can will continue to have their uh, growth mechanic. Um, being algorithmic makes it a lot easier to grow as a stable coin. And that's why when we look at the market cap, it has had a very aggressive growth. Um, and that is because it's a lot easier to grow when you don't need collateral. If you needed 16 billion worth of decentralized collateral, it would be really hard to grow and expand. However, um, with the mechanics of Bitcoin having as collateral, but only being partial collateral in events, in chaotic events, it allows for a faster growth, but also it allows for a release valve or a safety net um, if there ever is a situation of a black swan event. Now, this has actually changed, and well, not changed. The idea has always been to have a forex reserve. What they call it a forex reserve, but it's actually a reserve of different crypto um, that can help back UST. So recently, Avalanche is the second major layer one crypto asset next to Bitcoin uh, to be part of the UST reserve. So Lun um, Luna and Avalanche have partnered for Terra, and Avalanche will be part of the reserve to be able to be exchanged in events of Black Swan. So this um, was a quick overview on stable coins. I have not even dove into why, for example, uh, it is important that Luna and UST continue to grow and be adopted and used. As more usage comes, more stability comes to the system. Um, as you know, many users that come won't even look into is USDT collateralized or how does UST work? People just want to know that a stable coin is stable. So the more usage that UST has, the more stability it will have as its growth. Finally, a quick announcement. It has already happened a couple of days ago, but Near Protocol is set to launch their own stable coin called USN. 
What's USN? Well, essentially, it's a copy of UST. It will operate uh, very similarly to Luna and to Terra. So we can see near protocol on April 20th will launch their USN. So, and it's essentially um, a copy of Luna. Now, will this compete with UST? Is this bad? Is it bad competition? Well, no. One, UST has already won the race for now because of the early adopter advantage. They have already partnered with protocols. They are cross-chain in so many protocols. If we go to um, Stable Quant, he actually recently shared all the bridges that you can go to with UST. Um, this is huge. Um, because you can essentially use UST on all of these networks. Well, USN is going to launch on NIR and offer 20% APR, similar to Anchor, which is the biggest uh, DAP on Terra. And this is going to be uh, one very good for NIR because they're going to have a similar mechanic where they're going to be burning NIR tokens in exchange for USN. And they're going to offer a nice stable um, return for kind of staking your stable coins. So I believe there is space for many different kinds of stable coins. I believe there is space for algorithmic stable coins because NIR's stable coin will be algorithmic. So I, I, I fully support NIR and what they're trying to do. I think they will have some trouble with keeping up with the exponential growth that UST has had and will most likely continue to have um, with the recent moves that they've been making. So to wrap it all up, we covered uh, all the stable coins pretty much or the most important ones. Um, uh, if you want to know more about Neutrino, for example, which is still deep pegged but has been recovering, um, we, we saw it went as low as, wow, 76 cents, 72 cents all time low eight days ago. Um, this is Waves stablecoin, which operates slightly differently. It is also algorithmic, but it operates slightly differently uh, to UST or USN, uh, Nier's new stablecoin. Um, if you want to learn all about Waves, you can look for the video in the bird nest. There has been, uh, I did a video last week and uh, I know some people were able to short waves and make some good money on that. So do go check that out so you can understand uh, Neutrino USD. Um, I hope that this has been uh, educational for everyone to understand what stable coins are, how they work and why you might want to make sure that if you're looking uh, for a safe haven, you look for something that is decentralized and that you can use. So um, if you guys have any questions, reach out to me on the Burb Nest, uh, check out the trial links you can ask in the Discord. Um, you can reach out to me on Twitter. Um, but most importantly, uh, yeah, check out the Burb Nest and um, look for that trial link if, you, if you're not signed up. I hope this was helpful and I'll catch you on the next video.